So the lab this week we're going to be doing is the spirometry lab. So you're going to come into the exercise physiology lab. You're going to be using one of our wonderful aseptic uh, cardboard tubes effectively, exhaling into it, and then measuring those lung volumes. So uh, you want to make sure that obviously you're doing this on your own. We're using our own spirometry, and it's more than okay for one person to do the spirometry work and for multiple of you guys to use the same data. So AKA if you walk in the lab and somebody's already doing the testing, just go with their numbers. And like anything else, if you're not comfortable, there are the examples online that you guys can go ahead and just watch and copy down those numbers. Okay, so we have one student that is unable to hear me. Is everyone else able to hear me? Interesting. Okay, so yes, in theory, come into the lab and do the spirometry lab if you feel comfortable. If you don't, don't worry about it, guys. Instead, just go ahead and watch the video on YouTube and then use that for your information. So good uh, question. Now, anything else you guys want to go ahead and uh, ask questions about as far as anything outside of the gamut of the lecture we're about to get into? <laughs> Not seeing any yet, but if they do come up, we'll go ahead and go through it. But we're effectively going to talk about how the body is going to change thanks to doing resistance training. So how we're going to increase our performance, what's going into building strength, what are the causes of muscular soreness, and then how we're going to approach resistance training depending on working with a couple different types of populations. So like anything else, your basic changes in performance due to lifting weights is actually because you get better at using your muscles. And so that's literally the neuromuscular changes. We get a better job of recruiting those patterns and getting those muscles to fire with greater amount of synchronization and then just overall recruitment. Now, it turns out strength is incredibly important for just overall fitness and health. Being strong enough to carry your own groceries, to climb a flight of stairs, to just be independent. In fact, the two biggest correlates between independence longer in life is your aerobic fitness and then your strength. And like anything else, it's a big component of athletic training because we typically are trying to get our athletes to be stronger and then more powerful. So they're going to be a faster athlete. They're going to be able to overcome their opponents more easily and or be able to perform the different movements of the sport with a greater velocity, which typically in most all sports is going to really help with performance. So when we're talking about changing the body, the first really three to six months of resistance training, we can literally see a potential doubling of strength from where you started. Now, most of this is due to the neuromuscular side. We literally are getting better at performing those movements and really are able to, when lifting, give a much more realistic or accurate expression of our total performance. And yes, that would be the major uh, mechanism behind it that some people refer to in in fact, as kind of newbie gains. So like anything else, it's going to be dependent on a lot of things, previous training history, gender, your current age, how much injury you've experienced beforehand. So younger men, right, who've gone through puberty are gonna make typically the fastest gains in strength compared to younger women. And then older individuals don't progress as quickly and children typically They'll progress some, but not much because they don't have any of the hormonal advantages yet to really increase muscle mass. And this is thankfully due to our muscle plasticity, meaning our muscles are able to adapt to the demands we place upon them. And obviously asking them to pick up heavy objects, body's going to try to get better at so that we're going to be able to do it with greater ease in the future and be able to go and do so for perhaps more overall total efforts because the body doesn't really realize we're just lifting weights because we like to pick things up and put them down. All the body knows is there's a heavy freaking object and we've got to move it. And there might be another heavy object coming in the future that might be heavier. And so we should be ready for it. So what's going to be the major things that are increasing strength? Well, first and foremost, and like you guys spent a decent amount of time on limits of strength, which is literally how big is our muscle? If we increase the size of our muscle, we typically increase our strength and the opposite is true. Now it's more complex than that because then we're getting into the neuromuscular control of it. 
literally our ability to control and contract those muscles. And then outside of just our ability to control and contract those muscles, then we get into that allometric scaling. Then we're potentially getting into some limits of being able to transmit that force, our muscle attachments, our limb lengths, and anthropometrics, all of those are gonna be influencing how our strength potential. Now, as far as gain, we're talking mostly about muscle and neuromuscular changes. So we have here guys is the world records between men and women in the clean and jerk, the snatch, and then just the total. So that's the snatch and the clean and jerk. And you can see an obvious difference between men and women. Now, this is obviously super high level Olympic lifters. You notice you never see a perfect uh, meeting point on there just because we have those gender differences in fat mass. And, you know, effectively, typically your average male is six to 10% lower in body fat than your average female, but like anything else, this is the very best in the world. So yes, if your goal is to be the strongest human being on the planet, you probably need to be male. However, well, and even then we're really crummy athletes when you look at things like silverback gorillas, if we're talking about pure strength. But on the other side, this is on average. There's a number of women that are far stronger than men. In fact, if we go ahead and take a look at this, notice the world record for a 50, or actually it's a little bit less than a 50 kilogram female. I believe that weight class might be like 48, 49. <clears throat> Clean and jerks, 120 kilos. 120 kilos, folks, just to give you some context there, that is, uh, if we convert that over into American, 264 pounds. So a gal that barely weighs not even 110 pounds can clean and jerk more weight than a lot of the players on our football team who also markedly outweigh her. So even we're still looking at the best of the best, there's still that huge bell curve that people are gonna be located on one point or another. Now, our muscles are not gonna function unless our neurological system is going to cause them to contract, okay? So our strength gains, can occur without an actual change in hypertrophy. We can get stronger without actually putting on muscle. However, we are not going to be able to get any stronger if we are not able to obviously contract those fibers and much less those bigger fibers thanks to the effects of training. And this can be due to motor unit recruitment. So it's tapping those individual fibers. Stimulation frequency, meaning we send enough stimulus in a row. So we're gonna get fused tetanus and then other neurological factors, and that's the synchronization. So we get the entire muscle to contract together as opposed to just a couple of fibers here, a couple of fibers there, and they're kind of alternating as opposed to they all grab and pull at the same time, which is gonna give you a much greater force production. So typically we're not synchronized. We have fibers just fire enough to give us the force we need to. So we're gonna be able to do those lower gradations. Now we're talking about maximal force production. That's where once again, we want to get everything to contract at the same time. And this is gonna be useful because it's gonna allow us not just create more force, but it's going to increase our rate of force development. Meaning we're literally gonna be able to produce that maximal strength in a shorter period of time. So we literally are going to be able to increase our ability to produce a high and consistent force output. And this is thanks to doing things like resistance training. So when we are lifting weights with the goal of being stronger, remember, it is a skill. So we are going to get a greater amount of neural drive. So we're gonna be able to send more signal to those fibers. We're sending those signals more frequently and we're getting less inhibition from things like our Golgi tendon organs. So all those combined are gonna increase our total force. Now, like anything else, it's going to be both of these pieces. It's not just one or the other, but a combination that allows us to improve strength. And rate coding being another way of sending those charges more frequently, specifically when we're talking about things that are very powerful, very high movement. So this would be something like throwing a shot put uh, the clean and jerk, the snatch, where we have to turn everything on very rapidly, throwing a baseball. Now, autogenic inhibition is going to be different rate limiters we're going to have to make sure that we don't hurt ourselves. And that is going to be mostly headed up by the Golgi tendon organs, which remember is in your tendon. And when it detects a stretch on the tendon, it tells your muscle to relax. So that way we don't risk tearing the tendon off the bone. 
Now, as we train to become higher and higher levels of performance, we are going to get less of these inhibit inhibitory impulses from things like a GTO, which allows us to produce more force and also explains some of the more miraculous force production things you hear about. But unfortunately, this also, it is going to slightly increase our risk for injury because it turns out now we don't have a governor on the engine. We can just let the engine redline as hard as we want. Now, we're also going to do a better job of not activating the antagonist. So whenever you tend to contract a muscle, you're going to get a bit of contraction of also your antagonist as a means to make sure you keep that joint essentially from dislocating. So if you're doing a dumbbell curl, your biceps are the agonist and your triceps are the antagonist. And so what you're gonna find is over a longer period of time, you're actually gonna have less activation of those triceps when you're just activating those biceps for things like a curl. Now, we're also gonna see a change in the morphology of the neuromuscular junction. We're gonna do a better job of releasing acetylcholine there, clearing it as well. So this is going to be a natural effect from long-term consistent training to the individual muscle fibers in the muscle that you happen to be recruiting. So let's talk about what you guys really care about, getting swole. So muscle hypertrophy is just literally increasing muscle size. You have transient hypertrophy, so this is directly after you get done, this is the pump, okay? Now this is useful in that it's causing cellular signaling to get the chronic effect that we're going for in just a few moments. But like anything else, the pump you had is gonna go away over a relatively short period of time. Chronic hypertrophy is actual, like you have made long-term changes to your skeletal muscle system. You have now literally increased the amount of uh, sarcomeres you have inside of those individual fibers. And that's what's referred to as fiber hypertrophy. Potentially had what's known as fiber hyperplasia, which is where you're gonna split one fiber into another. It's it definitely happens in human, but it's not a very massive commonplace thing. And in other animal species, it's been documented to a much greater degree. So this is going to be maximized by doing a lot of eccentric training. So it's going to be lowering the heavy loads and the damage to your sarcomeres. And that damage in turn is going to tell our body that we need to repair those sarcomeres and hopefully in turn increase their number. Now, concentric training is an important part of the obviously contraction cycle we're going to have of lifting the weight and then lowering the weight. But like anything else, this is going to be the bigger component when it comes to the actual strength side, because the concentric, as you're lifting the weight, that's the skill. That's getting better at literally getting our muscles to contract and allow ourselves to move quickly. Now, you don't necessarily need to always do high velocity. This is where you need to do like tempo or slow eccentrics, which also have potential positive effects on hypertrophy and effectively are gonna be working slightly different functions of the muscle. Now, when we're talking about the way that we're going to be increasing strength through hypertrophy, well, we're talking about literally having more myofibrils, which literally means more actin, more my myosin. You're also naturally gonna have more sarcoplasm, which, and along with connective tissue, which is important just for the safety of the contractions you're doing, that you're not gonna tear anything off, but increasing the sarcoplasm increases the size of the muscle. When you increase the size of the muscle, that's gonna potentially give you a leverage advantage when it comes to strength movements, because literally in the bottom, you're gonna be hung up on the size of your forearm and the size of your bicep. So you can't literally get close to yourself unless you do that compression. You literally have that tissue in the way as opposed to passive and then contracting it naturally pulls you further from yourself simply due to the size of those muscle bellies compressing on one another. So resistance training itself is gonna increase what's known as muscle protein synthesis. This is literally going to be building more muscle protein. Your pro the proteins inside of your muscle are constantly being broken down and then built back up. So when we're actually exercising, we've got a much greater amount of degradation. So that's breakdown of the protein inside of the muscles. However, the increase in synthesis after exercise and the downregulation of degradation is gonna overcome this exercise period and allow, hopefully, for those chronic effects of increasing muscle hypertrophy. As well as it turns out, the joys of the hormone testosterone is going to also help with improving the size of those fibers. This is obviously a steroid hormone specifically produced in both men and women. In fact, women have more testosterone in their bloodstream than they do estrogen. Literally, you can look it up guys, that's a true thing. Now, at the same time, if you are now to go use in 
exogenous amounts of testosterone, you're going to get much, much larger. And you guys can look up a number of different pro bodybuilders and you'll figure it out pretty quick that um, there's a little extra something, something helping with uh, maintain and enhance that uh, muscular form. So hyperplasia is literally the splitting of one fiber into another. So we have a single fiber and then through training, we literally are gonna get it to effectively break into. Because remember, muscle cells are fascinating because they're multinucleated. Now it's definitely been documented literally in cats where they literally would reach and touch a bar and the overstretching and otherwise and having to move the bar being under a load in order to get food pellets would actually lead to an increase in the fiber, fiber number and fiber size. And unfortunately, they have to excise the muscle to count it. That's why it's really hard to do it in humans because it's not ethical. Um, whereas in uh, chickens and then a couple other birds, what's fascinating is literally they found, I was actually, I think it was more of a, some type of pigeon where they tied a heavy weight to their arm and the weight would literally cause their shoulder over a period of time to actually go through the same type of hyperplasia. And that's why DC training for a while was a big proponent of really hard stretching at the end of training. Probably, if anything, it was just better for the mobility than anything else. Now, obviously, in other animals, which we have a bit more in common with, technically, mice and rats, is just seeing an increase in fiber hypertrophy. So literally, the fibers are larger. Meanwhile, there's other human studies that show that the fiber number seems to be relatively similar between untrained and trained uh, individuals in some capacities. But in others, there was not much of a difference in fiber size after training meaning they increased the same amount compared to someone who is a trained bodybuilder as opposed to a, just a trained individual. However, it seems that the bodybuilders naturally maybe had more muscle fibers. Now that could be at birth or once again, could be a consequence of hyperplasia. This is one of those areas that's still kind of murky, but it's fascinating. So mostly what we're gonna be getting our muscle gains in is gonna be literally hypertrophy. Those individual fibers are gonna get better. Hyperplasia is also contributing, albeit to a small degree, and like anything else, it's probably related to how we're training. And specifically, when we're training with high intensities, we tend to see the greatest amount of hypertrophy in our type two muscle fibers. They're the ones that are the most readily adapted to strength and power style training. So if you naturally have a greater amount of type two fibers in the first place, it's going to give you a greater predisposition to naturally carrying around a greater amount of muscle mass. So. The reason, another reason why hyperplasia may occur is there's actually been studies looking at muscle changes in human. And effectively, if you looked at the size of the fibers from uh, pre to post increasing, if you just look at that sheer volume difference and then extrapolate it to the size of the muscle where it was beginning and then the end, the numbers didn't make sense. The muscle got bigger than the individual fibers expanded. So by nature of the beast, the argument becomes, well, there probably was some hyper pleasure that occurred, but we're still talking about it's less than 90% of your hypertrophy changes. Now, an important thing to understand just with muscle remodeling is going to be the activation and then binding of our satellite cells to our muscles. So this can occur through hyperplasia, but obviously it can also occur just due to heart training. So when we train hard, we're going to have the activation of these satellite cells that are naturally around all of our muscles. Effectively, they happen to be stem cells specifically for muscle. Now, once we go and we have that hard training, these in turn are going to move to the individual injured fibers and then literally fuse to it while we're producing, in theory, potentially much greater, or sorry, potentially having hyperplasia of these cells fusing together. This in turn is going to regenerate that individual fiber, which is going to increase its amount of uh, myonuclei, which in turn, we potentially go through that self-renewal and keep going and going. Now, why do we care about this? Well, this is another mechanism of performance. In fact, this is also heavily influenced by the hormone testosterone. So literally, when we're looking at the two genders, um, and obviously I'm speaking in from a binary standpoint, which you know, there's a number of conversations, it's fascinating because in theory, if someone actually goes through puberty and they are presenting as, you know, they do have testosterone levels which are normalized for a male, it would arguably give someone an unfair advantage for the rest of their life because they would have literally activated and fused naturally a much greater amount of myonuclei 
to their muscles than someone that had never been male. And even more so when we talk about athletes that have abused anabolic agents in order to enhance their performance, they've literally changed their physiology in a way that will make it so technically it's never fair for them to compete with a athlete that doesn't use drugs ever again in their life. But then again, we're going to talk more about drugs whenever we get to chapter 16 and I'll rant a lot and hopefully we'll have some fun. So in the chat right now, guys, why should we care about this? What's the major advantage of these satellite cells and them fusing to our muscle fibers? Why do we care about it? Not so much, but it's going to be a natural effect from the neurological signaling you did for working out. They do help with increasing muscle mass and they help with the muscles regenerating. And once we've done this, yes, they're important in the fiber repair. When we increase the amount of nuclei to an individual muscle fiber, now, instead of just one nucleus that effectively is one factory building more proteins in that muscle to help it be bigger and maintain its performance, we now have two factories that are building that individual fiber to allow it to function and do its job. And so if we keep increasing the amount of myonuclide to an individual fiber, that fiber is gonna repair itself faster. And this is part of potentially the different mechanisms of how individuals, when they go through a long training layoff and then come back, they're going to, it took them X amount of time to get to their level, best level of performance. They take a time off, they come back here, but they get to that previous maximal level of performance faster the second time than it took them the first time. And arguably a big component of that is literally the ability to increase myonuclei. So what are we gonna see? Well, in the first eight to 10 weeks of training, the major changes we're gonna have in performance are mostly due to neurological factors. After that, it's mostly all related to hypertrophy. And so increasing muscle mass to a significant extent takes a considerably long a period of time. It's not something that's gonna be done in a day. It's going to take months and years to accomplish. So after that first two and a half months, the major reason you're getting stronger in any movement is simply to increase the muscle size. Um, as far as the, the amount of myonuclear domain and the amount of nuclei to an individual fiber, it definitely does. As to what that number is off the top of my head, I could not tell you other than like anything else, the body, once you have, you, you're going to get to a point where the concentration is just a little, it's just too ridiculous. Instead, think of it along the lines of, uh, one way to think of it would be like a farming example. So if we give you, all of a sudden you have a thousand acres of land and you are in charge of farming that land and you have to do it all by hand. How many acres of land do you think you can really farm on your own? You can maintain, you can take care of, you can do everything that needs to be done. You think you'll be able to take care of all thousand acres by yourself, by hand. Yeah, you can probably definitely take care of one, maybe two, maybe three, heck, maybe even five acres, but definitely not a hundred, definitely not a thousand. So from there, okay, well, what's the easiest way that we could effectively allow more of that land to be farmed. If we're not allowed to use any machines, what could you do? Add more farmers, bingo. And now we can farm more land. So that's gonna be a greater amount of land. And that's, we're talking about multinucleation. So literally you're just allowing yourself to take care of a greater amount of area. The thing that's probably the more limiter there, Randall, is probably the capillary density. So your ability to just deliver nutrients to the fiber because once the fiber gets to be so big, the capillaries are so far from one part to the other that it's just going to be under fuel, so you can't really maintain anymore. But that's the advantage of 
activating these muscle satellite cells, getting the fuse with your adult fibers, and in turn, increase your nuclei, your myonuclei number. So like anything else, as soon as you stop training, you're going to start losing strength. Now, it depends on to what level. We're talking about immobilization, like you're literally on your back doing absolutely nothing. We're going to see some insane quick drops. Now, detraining, that's going to be a bit slower, more like 5% in a month. But literally, when we talk about putting you in a cast, we can already start to see the beginnings of atrophy, like the cellular signaling for it, in literally just six hours. After one week, we can literally be talking about a strength loss of three to 4% per day of decreasing the muscle size, along with decreasing our neurological ability to contract those muscle fibers. Your muscles are very calorically expensive to uphold, to maintain. So the body doesn't want to have any more muscle than is completely necessary to do the things that you're trying to do with your life. Now, like anything else, you're going to find that it is reversible. As your cross-sectional area goes down, you're going to be able to go back up. Your type 1 fibers are actually more rapidly affected than your type 2. And the reasoning for this being is it's more important for the body to maintain power output than it is to maintain endurance. Because if you have to fight for your life, it's probably not going to involve running a marathon. It's probably going to involve putting out massive amounts of effort in a short period of time. That's why sedentary people typically have the greatest amount of the type 2 X fibers, because it's all about preservation of the person, not about trying to maintain long, consistent, submaximal efforts. Now, if you aren't training as hard as you were before, you will go backwards, which is a brutal fact of training. So as you keep training for longer and longer, you have to figure out some way to progress that program. So you're doing more work or you're doing the same work in the, sh in the shorter period of time or some form of essentially progression, which is brutal. Now, we can find that we're going to be able to regain this pretty quickly, like six to eight weeks, depends, of course, how strong you were in the first place. And it's quite typical to see when you're talking about untrained populations, for them to train for a bit, detrain, and then train again and surpass the previous RMs. Now, this is not being done with high-level athletes, because no high-level athlete is going to per purposefully take a month off from training, much less completely lay on their back and do nothing. So, like anything else, once we get to where we want to be, we need to maintain our program so that way we're not going to be going backwards. This means we don't necessarily need to be training as many times per week as we were before, but we should probably be giving ourselves a very strong stimulus in this area at least once per week, most likely preferentially twice. And I'm referring to per movement patterns. So if you're trying to maintain overall body strength, it's not like you can squat once per week and you're going to be able to keep hold of your military press strength you still have to be training those patterns as well. So what we have here, guys, is progression in 1RM from see a pre to post training. So 20 weeks, time off, and then post six weeks. So we see how there's that progression in the squat. Leg press got, it went backwards and then went forward again, but nowhere near the high, same high levels they were previously. And then when looking at the leg extension, because everyone cares about that, right? We're going to see obviously progression over the first 20 weeks, time off, and then six weeks, and they were pretty much right back to where they were. So the nice thing is the body's going to adapt. Notice here, guys, the size of those muscle fibers. See how the type ones are going to maintain and go up. Our type 2A and our type 2X are the ones that are going to be responsive to the detraining because these folks were simply not lifting weights anymore. However, they were allowed to be recreationally active. So it wasn't like they were in a coma for six weeks. So like anything else, the greater periods of time that we train over, we're going to see, we've got a certain amount of fiber type plasticity, but after that, we're gonna see that our type two fibers are gonna be able to take on a greater amount of aerobic performance, increasing the mitochondrial levels, increasing the enzymes related to aerobic metabolism. And then if we're doing a lot of just strength power training, we're gonna see our type two fibers taking on some of those elements as well even seeing potentially some shifting in what's known as myosin light chain, but we're, that's something that's kind of beyond the scope of this class. And like anything else, we're going to see conversions. So if you're going to do a lot of really heavy, hard training, literally some of Steren's work from the early 90s, 
with women, they were seeing significant changes in fiber type expression after only two weeks of hard resistance training in an otherwise relatively sedentary population. So we have a certain amount of ability to adapt. Now your best, the best athletes were naturally gifted with a huge amount of either fast twitch or slow twitch fibers. They can be good at that or endeavor. But we all have an ability to change somewhat and obviously consistent hard training is gonna cause those conversions to start to occur. So typically the most normal one to see is that type 2X converting to 2A or to your type one. Now, like anything else, any time that we're training for any real period of time, our type 2X is gonna be going down. Sometimes you're gonna see the type one converting more into 2A if we're doing a lot of heavy resistance training and then kind of speed sprinting style work but it's going to, once again, come down to the stimulus. And it's not, when a lot of this research was done, people either were runners or they were weightlifters, especially with the literature, they didn't have a lot of people that were trying to do both. So if we're trying to talk about being able to do all of these things, okay, now we're gonna see a lot of interesting changes to those fibers, where yes, our 2As are gonna have more mitochondria, but our type ones also might have more power adaptation if we're literally trying to train to be a little bit good at everything. So that obviously becomes very daunting, but it is something to understand that your body has the plasticity. It's just trying to get better at the things you're asking it to do. So we all know what wonderful soreness feels like. There is a difference between the acute and the delayed onset. The acute, we're talking more about metabolic byproducts, the chronic soreness afterwards. Now we're talking about literal, legitimate damage that's also causing a expression of different types of actually immune signaling and otherwise in the body to fix the damage you've done. So this is going to come from doing heavy, high intensity, exhaustive training, or just doing something that is new that the body's not used to. So it's going to be influenced by things like hydration levels, uh, nutrition, and then obviously the total amount of volume you're doing. So when we're literally talking about you set the weights down and things burn, joys of the wonderful proton you've just made, along with, yeah, you can have the pump that can be a little uncomfortable at certain points because of that, uh, that swelling in turn is going to put a little pressure on the nerves, which once again can be uncomfortable. This is something that's gonna be gone in a couple minutes to maybe a couple hours. It's completely normal. And it's actually, if anything, can be a decent indicator of letting you know that the training you were doing was at least productive enough in those specific muscle groups to cause your body to be uncomfortable. So if you're specifically training kind of on more of a bodybuilder, potty part split, or just trying to train certain movement patterns, well, hopefully all of the muscles in those patterns are going to have a little bit of this type of discomfort dysregulation, because that's gonna let you know you actually did ask them to do more than the body would prefer. Now, delayed onset muscle soreness, now we're talking one to two days after the exercise, and this is due to literal damage to your type one fibers. Now, this can sometimes cause not just a lot of pain, but stiffness, you're not able to move that well. And this is due to eccentrics. So if you want to know what this type of misery is like, go ahead and do some downhill running. It's gonna cause a lot of this type of eccentric damage, which is causing Z-line streaming. Now, notice this is not caused by blood lactate. If you have lactate enough that's causing soreness in the muscle, a day or two later, you are dying. Or more importantly, that limb is dying because we're not sending enough blood flow to it. So yeah, when you finish, yes, it could be lactate. The next day, no, that is due to this damage, which is gonna cause some other signaling. So all the structural damage in turn is going to put a number of different muscle enzymes, creating kinase being the most typical one that's tested for, literally into the bloodstream. This is going to let the body know, or more or less, it's gonna be an indicator to anyone who's doing a blood draw on you that you've gone through some pretty heavy, some pretty hard training. And like anything else, this is going to be related to the number of those enzymes in the blood because literally we've done damage. We've even broken open the sarcolemma a little bit and some of the proteins inside have leaked out. Now, not to the point at which we've got rhabdomyolysis, which is the death and destruction of muscle cells, which we're gonna to get to in a little bit. So. When I say Z-line streaming, we're literally talking about damage to the Z-lines that are at the end of the sarcomeres where all the actins bracket together. This is literally where we're getting 
essentially the myosin on either time is pulling on those actin strands that are linked on the Z and that's where we can have some tearing. Now, this is not a bad thing as long as it's within certain realms because this is going to be a causative signaling factor to get us to improve the size of that muscle, which in turn should increase the strength of it structurally, which in turn is going to allow you to tolerate that future trainer training with much greater ease. So you can literally see that type of damage and dysregulation with the joys of the Fritz Hagerman um, uh, microscopy, where you can actually see like a number of these cell membranes are just shredded all the pieces. And you can see a little bit here with that streaming and that's just gonna be due to the wonderful damage. Oh God, that, that looks like somebody went through one heck of a squat day. That's awesome, uh, but heavy miserable to look through. Okay, so what's also going to occur is you're going to actually have a localized immune response to those areas. This is part of the reason why really hard training is gonna slightly suppress your immune system because now our immune system is literally going to that area and dealing with all of those wonderful muscle proteins and otherwise that have been leached out of it. So we're going to see our actual white blood cell count naturally goes up as we have soreness. Now this can be related somewhat to the amount of inflammation and pain because it turns out these neutrophils, which are part of our white blood cells, different types, are going to then release chemicals. And also we've also got a certain amount of free radicals that are being produced, which in turn is going to stimulate our nerves, which is why we are going to be uncomfortable as our macrophages are cleaning out that debris. So breaking down those different muscle proteins that leached out and just breaking them down into amino acids so they can then be utilized for energy inside the macrophage or just sent throughout the body so they can be used someplace else. So we're going to do really hard, heavy training. Okay. This in turn is going to cause some dysregulation of calcium. Our cell might not be able to work as well. And we're going to have some enzymes that break down those Z discs as that Z line streaming. Then we're going to now have an increased amount of neutrophils, which in turn are going to release their signaling compounds that are now going to go ahead and thanks to not just kinins, potassium and histamine are going to cause a little bit of discomfort in those wonderful nerve cells. And like anything else, we're gonna have a greater amount of this when we're doing really heavy eccentric style training. Heavy, of course, is relative to the individual's performance and their abilities. So your heavy and my heavy are two different things numerically, but our heavies are going to probably be the same when it comes to percentage of our max, unless one of us is lying. So if you're lifting a load to the point at which you can't lift it anymore, that's pretty heavy. That's doing a lot of damage to the fibers that are left that are trying to keep essentially dealing with those forces. And those forces are now being transmitted through them, which in turn can cause this damage. So... This damage in turn, now that we've released those intracellular proteins, we're going to be increasing our protein turn turnovers. That's what we're talking about, increasing our synthesis and hopefully not increasing our uh, breakdown too much. But like anything else, depending on how aggressive we're training, we could have this being massively upregulated, which is why you don't want to train until you're wrecked all the time, but you definitely want to make sure you're getting some good soreness on occasion. So this is going to use both the intra and extracellular molecules which in turn is going to do signaling to increase the muscular size. But as far as what are the exact causative mechanisms and how we're going to get this repairing through a different types of intracellular signaling pathways, it's not perfectly understood those relationships. But we can definitely tell you when you're really sore, you're not very strong. In fact, there's some studies where literally they got people so jacked up from doing maximal eccentrics on isokinetic bicep curls that these folks were literally, the next day they went back to the lab, not even able to produce 50% of their initial maximum. Think about the equivalent of, for someone that's a squatter, if you squat 300 pounds, you literally wouldn't be able to walk into the gym and squat a buck 85, your legs would be that wrecked. So this is due to a number of different things. We've got the damage to the muscle itself, damage going on with neuromuscular junction, and the loss of that contractile protein. So if we're thinking of this as a timeline, that right after we get done training, in these examples, oh my God, it's still just like the idea of 50% loss in strength just blows my mind. Most of it is literally just neuromuscular. We just can't turn it on. Then part of it is the physical disruption. After about three days, 
We've got a loss of contractile protein because of all the degradation we did because we did way too much work and still issues with muscle contraction. But notice, even one month later, because of doing that hard of training for these individuals, they were still 5% weaker. And therein lies one of the things to keep in mind with training is you can always do more. It's not always productive and it's not always a good choice. So just because you can do more volume does not mean it's going to be a good thing for you. Instead, you're trying to track your own recovery, making sure that yes, you are disrupting your performance. You're decreasing by maybe 10, possibly 20% at the end of that session compared to you know the next day. And then you're going back to the previous level of strength, if not surpassing it, because the goal of training is to get better, not to drive yourself down a hole and be in, a, well, let's just say going deep into the pain cave. So when we've got a lot of muscular damage, we actually decrease the rate at which we can resynthesize glycogen. So that's a problem, irregardless if you're an anaerobic or an aerobic type athlete, because that's, remember, one of the energy systems we're going to probably be living in unless we're going super long and slow or real short and fast. And so this is going to cause literally a slowing, if not a stoppage of muscle repair. And that's why carbohydrates are very useful and important when it comes to muscle regeneration from heart training. And so if we can't store as much fuel, we're not going to be as good of an anaerobic power athlete or an aerobic power athlete because we're not going to be able to keep that up. Now, we can see how we've got pain shifting forward, edema in the beginning, plasma creating kinase levels peaking after, you know, probably about four or five days. And then we've got three uh, methyl, oh gosh, uh, excretion, of course, I'm going to forget what the E stands for. Uh, obviously, a lower glycogen levels for notice, guys, almost three weeks and obviously damage to the fiber itself and then weakness, which can lend itself for two weeks. So this is in a specific study of doing a massive, massively large volume of training beyond which the body can recover from. So remember, the goal is not to beat yourself up. Anybody can do that. Anyone can put on a tight t-shirt and scream at someone until they cry on a leg press, but instead thinking about, okay, how much stimulus am I applying to this individual? How much stimulus can they recover from? And not just, and then asking ourselves, what's the minimal stimulus we can apply to them, which is going to allow them to get better? Because why be in the gym and do 10 sets if you can only do one set? Yes, uh, Evan, that's a great point. In fact, there's a number of different types of very, very intense uh, military training regimes that effectively, they bust those people to pieces. Uh, people that do uh, ranger uh, school for the for the army and otherwise like they're known for just being absolutely um, just wrecked for a pretty decent period of time thanks to all that volume of work they're making their bodies do so it's it's just very important to contextualize everything to how much work someone's used to and then yes we're going to progress it but we want to progress it in a logical way so we're not going from zero to a thousand instead we're going from one to two to three to four and when your training no longer causes any soreness, no disruption, great, they're, they're adapted to it. Now we've got to get more intense. But your goal shouldn't be to have anybody after they work out with you, they got to use um, crutches for the next couple of days. That's not helping anybody other than maybe your ego if you're into hurting people, which anyways. So the easiest way to avoid DOMS is to not do the training in the first place we're not trying to do a lot of eccentrics and heavy eccentrics when we start off with, we want to start off with lower intensities and build our way into appropriate training volumes. And sometimes you want to come out hard and fast just because it's like, okay, they're going to have to understand the first week is going to suck. But then after that, their body's going to start adapting to it a lot more rapidly. But on top of this, making sure that we're staying hydrated, we're appropriately fueling ourselves with nutrition and we are getting sleep allowing our bodies to recover. Now, the next component we've got is the joys of muscle cramps, which I'm sure all of you guys have had happen to you at least once in your life, irregardless of how well trained or untrained you were at the time. Now, this can be obviously when we're competing, this can be after, or this can be when you're laying around, hanging out. Any of you guys just on occasion have a wonderful back cramp or, or back spasm while you're trying to sleep? That's, uh, that's not what I would describe for it. 
Oh, that sounds pretty unpleasant. So obviously the exercise induced is gonna be related to the work you did. Uh, cramping at night, it can also be potentially due to things like electrolyte imbalances, but the simple reality is we don't fully understand it yet. We know it's gonna be caused by a myriad of things from genetics to lifestyle. And at the same time, we've got some basic advice we can give individuals, but it's not that highly personalized. There are some groups that are trying to determine electrolyte levels from your sweat. So that way you can replenish electrolytes based upon what you truly lost. So you're gonna be able to enhance your performance and recovery that way. So the first type we're gonna have is going to be from just straight up overload. So literally we've done too much work to that muscle. And now we're going to go ahead and have a muscle that's cramping up pretty heavily. This would be if you did like some really, really heavy training or decided to do a lot of squats and you hadn't squatted in a long time, then all of a sudden, boom, your muscle's contracting for no reason. Now, the second type is gonna be more of electrolyte. So this is, we've literally sweated out too much of our sodium, our potassium, highly unlikely, or, or highly unlikely our potassium, but our chloride. And this is going to cause those electrochemical gradients to not be as great. So it's literally putting us closer to threshold when we're at baseline, which in turn, boom, that becomes really easy to accidentally contract your muscles. So both can occur. And obviously if you're talking about doing a huge amount of training uh, in the late summer for a sport, you can have a combination of both these. You're doing a lot of volume because you're maybe doing two days and you're also not replenishing your electrolytes because you're sweating a lot. So the things that's probably gonna relate in, or help with all these is rest and stretching. So hanging out and making sure we're stretching those muscles. Now, if it's gonna be more heat related, this is where we're gonna be talking about using electrolyte solutions. There's a lot of different products out there. Sometimes massage and ice can be useful, but being on top of our fluids, being on top of our electrolytes, giving them frequently, and then also making sure that we're not afraid to salt our foods and otherwise throughout the rest of the day. So we're gonna be able to avoid any of this occurring. Now, this slide makes me laugh to no end in my head because the book posits that being a female is a special population, even though women make up the majority of the population. So go figure. Um, yeah, you can develop strength in men and women. Didn't see that coming. Um, on average, like I said, women are as strong as men, mostly due to muscle size and hormonal differences, which is what causes that muscle size difference. And yeah. We can use the same techniques with both men and women. We just need to make sure like anything else, we're programming appropriately for the people we're working with. And if anything, what you typically find on average working with female trainees compared to on average with male trainees is average female trainees actually care about technique and using the full range of motion. So you've got that positive going for you. Whereas guys, you know, they just want to lift the heaviest weight they can and, you know, who cares about squatting in parallel? That's for, I don't know other people. Then again, they also don't care about squatting because it's Monday and we know everybody's benching. Now, age is an important component to keep in mind. You can train kids. You can get them to lift weights. The key is there's not a real good point to take a little kid to a 1RM. Who cares what their max is? They're a little kid. They do not need to hit a 1RM in the back squat, deadlift, snatch, etc. Instead, just teach them how to move well get them used to doing a lot of volume. So that's, and we can talk about calisthenics. That's why a lot of those kids, if you ever met anybody that was a, a wrestler or a gymnast growing up, they usually have really awesome body weight relative strength because they were training that for relatively long periods of time. It's not gonna stunt your growth, not eating is gonna stunt your growth. And like anything else, it's gonna help with just overall quality of life and performance. Now, when we talk about working with older individuals, sarcopenia, muscle loss as you get older is a real thing. So doing what we can to avoid muscle loss or to maintain that muscle for as long as possible as you can have independence and a decent quality of life is really important. Now, the key when you're working with older folks is keeping in mind that turns out they've got a lot of miles on the engine, on the car, on everything else. There's probably some injuries. There's probably some injuries they haven't thought about for potentially decades. So we want to take it easy with our progressions and understand that, yeah, they're not going to gain strength as fast as a young person. So like anything else, take it slow, build the volume slowly with time and have a conversation because it's a human you're working with, not a machine. And we're going to get into the resistance training for sport a little bit uh, when we talk next time and then definitely talking more of the long-term factors in training in future chapters. 
Anyone else have any questions, comments, concerns? I realize I've now gone over. Questions, comments, concerns? Anything you guys want me to go ahead and wax and wane the poetic on a little bit more for you? All right, guys, stay safe out there. Make sure you do that spirometry lab at some point during the week. The lab's gonna be open during the days. And if you don't feel comfortable, watch that video online. Otherwise, take care of yourselves, guys, and I will see you guys all later. Bye-bye.